This morning's scripture reading will come from Acts 2, 36 through 38. Acts 2, 36 through 38. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same that God had made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, good morning. Good to see everybody here today. Hope that everybody's doing all right this morning. Good to see visitors with us. We always appreciate you. And uh, as Derek said earlier, if you do have any questions or comments, questions, comments, let's hold back on the comments. If you have any questions about anything that you see or hear while you're with us today, don't hesitate to ask. If you ask for comments, things can get a little hectic. You know what I meant to say. I taught, well, we did our overview on the book of 1 Corinthians this past Wednesday night, and one of the issues that we discussed in that class was what Paul talked about in terms of baptism in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and the fact that he had, that according to him, he had baptized relatively few people there, and he was thankful for that. But the reason he was thankful for that was because people in the church at Corinth were uh, basically basing their claim to Christianity on who had baptized them. And the church was splintered into these groups. And as you read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's about verse 12 or 13. He says, some of you are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. He was thankful, not that he had baptized people, but not that he had not baptized people, but that that he hadn't baptized people to such an extent there that they were claiming his leadership as if he were the, the originator of the Christian faith. And so we talked about that for a bit Wednesday night, and we got home, and Gail uh, asked me some questions about some of the things I said. So we're going to make some clarification this morning. Not clarification. I went back and watched some of the video about what we were talking about. And I said in that video, I knew what I said, but I went back and checked anyway. Um, sometimes... When you're teaching, questions come up or a discussion is going on, and you may say some things that you understand what you're saying, but perhaps those in the audience don't understand what you're saying. That's, and I try, I try to avoid that. I don't always avoid that. That's one of the reasons I say every time I get up here, if you have any questions about what I say, ask me. Don't go around and talk to others about it. Come to me, and I'll be happy to, to answer your questions and and if there needs to be a clarification, I'll clarify it and make it right. And we all need to be that way. But anyway, I want us to talk about this today because that subject does come up. Now, what other people do there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you're in that chapter, you get down to verse 17 and Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And what they do with that verse is they say, well, see, Paul didn't think baptism was that important. That's not what he's saying at all. The apostles were commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That was their commission. The, the great commission is not, go ye into all the world and baptize everybody. The great commission is, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now here's the response to the preaching of the gospel. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's why Paul said what he said in 1 Corinthians 1.17. A lot of folks pull that out of its context and say that, well, it's not important because Paul said it's not important. That's not what he said. And he also didn't say baptism's not important. So this is a fundamental lesson today. You know, Peter, you go to 2 Peter chapter 1, and he talks about the Christian graces, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance. He talks about some very fundamental things. And in 2 Peter 1 and verse 12, he says that, basically, I know you know these things, but as long as I'm alive... I'm not going to fail to remind you of these things. I'm going to put you in remembrance of these things, even though you know them and are established in the present truth. That's kind of what I want to do today. We've been do doing that series on the, the threats against the home. We'll get back to that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But let's talk about the ins and outs of baptism for a few minutes this morning. When, when you say the ins and outs of something, what you're talking about is 
You're looking at the peculiarities of something or the technicalities. You're getting down to what we might say or what we might call are the nuts and bolts of it, breaking it down. Now, I want to say a couple of things first before we get started in on the biblical text. Everyone who has ever read the Bible in connection with the subject of baptism has the same about, same amount of information that I have. If you're reading your English Bible, you have the same information that I have on this subject. You don't have a version that reads any differently. Now, versions may read a bit differently in the particular words that they use, but they say the same thing in terms of the meaning of this particular subject. We need to understand that. There is no secret here, all right? This is not some mysteriously revealed doctrine to the churches of Christ about baptism. It's not some doctrine come up with by the churches of Christ, and a lot of people believe that, and they're absolutely wrong. There's no secret to this doctrine, all right? Everybody who reads any verse on baptism, their verses say what my verses say, and they say what your verses say. And it's, it's like sometimes people are reading completely different documents when we get to talking about this subject, but it's not. Here's the problem. If there are differing doctrines on baptism, you can know that those doctrines do not come from what is revealed in Scripture. I mean, that's just as plain as I can say it. They're getting it somewhere else. And what happens a lot of times is people are connected with a particular theological perspective, particular denomination, let's say, and they adopt that system of belief, whatever that doctrine of whatever that system of doctrine is, and that's what they believe. And many times people don't take the time to investigate what the Bible says. My church says, my pastor says, my preacher says, it doesn't matter what your preacher says if it doesn't line up with Scripture. And that includes me. We need to check what the Bible says because, again, everyone who has ever read the Bible has the exact same amount of information on baptism that I have and that you have. So having said that, I'm not going to click through all these. I'm just going to put them up there. Let's start looking in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Notice this process here. Step one is, go ye therefore and teach. All right. Step two, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So you've taught, you've baptized, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Teach, baptize, teach. But you notice what it says there about baptism. Into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You will notice the specificity of those statements. It doesn't say baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It says into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it says it that way for a reason. When a person, is, when, when a person submits themselves, submits their will to God's will on baptism... They are becoming a possession of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You're being baptized into a relationship with the Godhead. That's what Matthew 28, 18, 28 verse 19 is telling us. This is significant. And something else to me that makes it significant is these are some of the very last words that Jesus would ever speak on earth to his disciples. He's getting ready to ascend back to the Father. You know, you, you read Matthew 28. 18 to 20, you could flip your Bible to Acts chapter 1 and it picks up with the ascension. This is the Great Commission and he's telling them what they're doing and why they're doing it. You go preach and you baptize and then you continue to teach after that point. You turn over to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the Great Commission. Now, if a person hears, this is verse 16. You hear it. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now that verse, if you notice, that verse is not a commandment. That verse is a promise. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be condemned. Well, why doesn't he say at the end of verse 16, well, he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be condemned. He doesn't have to say that. And I've told you that before. The way I've illustrated that is I've never had anybody ever in 25 years of preaching call my office and say, hey, Barry, I don't believe in Jesus. Will you baptize me? That's not going to happen. Jesus didn't have to say it. He didn't have to repeat himself. He said it. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. 
That's what it means. If you don't believe, you'll be condemned. We get then to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. You go back to verse 21 of Acts chapter 2, and one of the things that Peter says, and he's quoting from Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, he says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, what does that mean? That's why I had Dalton read verses 36 to 38, because Peter preaches his sermon. And when you get down to verse 37, it says, When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Do you know what verse 37 is? Verse 37 is explaining verse 21. They are calling out to the name of the Lord in verse 37. What shall we do? What's Peter's response to that? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He appeals to the authority of Jesus in the name of Jesus Christ. For what purpose? For the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That verse says the same thing to me that it says to every other person of any different faith in the religious world. They were to repent and repentance and baptism are joined with that coordinating conjunction. And it pulls two things together. You repent and you are baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of sins. And to remit, to remit something means you're sending it away. That's why they were to repent and be baptized. That's what it means to call on the name of the Lord. You do what he's told you to do. Now those verses say the same thing to everybody. There's no different teaching. There's no different doctrine here that can be come up with by different religious institutions. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 16. One thing that... One thing that you're going to notice here, I don't use every verse that mentions baptism because there are several verses in your New Testament that just like they just record that, like, for instance, Acts 18, 8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. That doesn't really tell us anything about baptism other than that the Corinthians were. So I've left out those verses. We're looking at verses that talk to us about specifically what is this all about, the ins and outs of baptism. So far, we know that if you believe and are baptized, you'll be saved. And we know that if you repent and, are bapti and be baptized, your sins will be sent away. They'll be remitted. So here in Acts chapter 16 and verse 34, we have an account of a baptism. Uh, when they had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now, this is the account of the Philippian jailer. They believed in God with all his house. You jump back up to verse 31, and that's what Paul told him. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And so he believed and was saved. But there's something that goes on between those two statements. Verse 32, they, they spoke the word of the Lord unto him. How could they believe in the Lord and be saved if they've never heard of the Lord? Some people like to take Acts 16.31 all by itself and say, see, all you have to do is believe. And there again, that's not what's going on here. They were told, yes, you need to believe and you will be saved. But in order to believe, the first thing that has to happen is you have to hear the word of God, isn't it? So they preached or they spoke, verse 32, the word of the Lord unto him and to all who were in the house. What was the result of them having heard the word of God? Took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. He and all his immediately. The King James says straightway. It means they did, there was no hesitation here uh, in their responding to the command of baptism. They had to hear first. And it is true, by the way, and I'm actually working on some material for this for some lessons. It is true that we are saved by faith. The Bible says that repeatedly. Now, the mistake that a lot of people make is they add the little word alone in there. The Bible never says that. Not in the Old Testament. It doesn't say it in the New Testament. It never says anyone is saved by faith alone. To be saved by faith and to be saved by faith alone are two completely different, different concepts. So the Philippian jailer here was saved because he believed in God with all his house. Verse 34. Well, that believing in God with all his house included hearing the word of the Lord. Verse 32. And being baptized. It's all, it includes all of that. That's part of what it means to believe in the Lord. You turn over to Acts chapter 22, and we get to the account of Saul of Tarsus. This is where he is on trial, and he's giving a, basically a defense of his 
his work as a Christian, his preaching the gospel, and he's, he's recounting the story of when he was uh, approached by the Lord on the road to Damascus. He was struck blind, was blind for three days, prayed and fasted. And during that process of time, over here, the Lord talks to Ananias and says, you need to go here and you need to talk to this man. And that's what we have Paul recounting here. Ananias gets to him, Acts 22, and verse 16. Why tarriest thou? Now, why would Ananias start off that way? Why would that be the first thing that he says to him? Well, because Paul's been in the house without his eyesight. He's not been eating, and he's been praying for three days. You can read all of that in Acts chapter 9, about verses 10 to 18. Ananias' message is, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins. And here's that little phrase again, calling on the name of the Lord. Just like back in Acts 2 and verse 21. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's the same thing that's going on here with Saul of Tarsus. What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's part of the ins and outs of baptism. Sins are washed away when we obey that command of God. Sins are remitted. Salvation comes about. We have all these things so far. So let's turn to Romans chapter 6 real quick. Part of this passage here, this, this passage here as well as the, the Colossians verse, really get us into some church history a bit because throughout the evolution of church history, you have this, this practice known as clinical baptism that comes into play. I would say within 100 to 200 years after the first century. And what clinical baptism is essentially is if a person's too sick to be immersed, you can pour or sprinkle water on them. And so in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we're told that baptism is a burial. So look at it here. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We see this word baptized throughout the New Testament. But what, is it, what does it mean? You know, what's the definition of that term? Well... The term is just that. Look at verse 4. Verse 3, you need to be baptized. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism. That tells us what it is. It's an immersion, a burial by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Listen, you can't be raised up from having water poured on you. You can't be raised up from having water sprinkled on you. You have to be buried and when you're buried is when you come in contact with the blood of Christ. You're buried into his death and you're raised up to walk in newness of life. You cannot be a Christian before you are buried in baptism. You can't have the new life before you die to the old life and are buried. Because once you're buried is when you are raised up to walk in newness of life. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 13. This is an extremely important concept here. Everything's straightforward so far. In every person's Bible, whether they believe in the necessity of baptism or not, every person's Bible says the same thing in all of these verses. So why do so many people, why do so many people deny the need for it? Why are so many churches... Why do so many churches attack the churches of Christ for a works-based salvation because we talk about the necessity of baptism? It's not because the Bible conflicts with anything we're saying. I mean, we're just laying it out here. People are so married to their religious heritage. They're so married to their um, theological perspective that they will not, they won't allow the Bible to speak for itself. Let's just say it that way. And that's sad to see. But 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 is one of these important verses. For by one spirit are we all baptized, look at this, three words here, into one body. Now, we need, we need to admit this. There are many religious groups in our world. There are many denominations that practice immersion. They will bury you in water. But here's what you need to understand about that. They bury you in water into their group. They may say, well, this is for the remission of sins, 
but you're being baptized into their denomination, their religious body, their religious group, which we know from history that the development of Protestant denominationalism is about 1,500 years after the New Testament. You could not, it was an impossibility for you to be baptized into a denomination in the first century. It couldn't happen because they didn't exist. Now, it's very possible that that can happen today, that a person can be baptized into somebody other than the body of Christ, and that is not the proper baptism. It may be an immersion, and the person may say, this is for the remission of sins, but what they're doing is they're baptizing you into, their, into the membership of their religious body. That was not even possible in the first century. When a person is baptized into Christ, they are baptized into the one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and we've all been made to drink into one spirit. That is, we're partaking of what's been provided by the Holy Spirit. And you can't find that in denominationalism. It's not possible. We need to be sure that we've been baptized into the one body. Some people try to say, well, that's Holy Spirit baptism in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. What we need to understand about that, I'll just address that real quickly. Holy Spirit baptism always led to power. You see it in Acts 2 and Acts 10. If you're baptized in the Holy Spirit today, you ought to be able to speak in tongues. Because that's precisely what happened every time we see it occur in the New Testament. And we only see it twice. You see it in Acts 2 and you see it in Acts 10. This is not Holy Spirit baptism. This is baptism. And, and see, that's the thing. Paul wouldn't have to explain this to the Corinthians. Have you ever thought about it that way? He spent a year and six, month, six months in Corinth. They knew about baptism. They, these people were baptized. You go to Acts, again, Acts 18.8. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. He didn't have to go through this discussion with them that we're having right now. They weren't deluded with all the denominational influences that exist in our world today. They knew exactly what he meant. And that's what we have to do with Scripture. We have to understand it from their perspective. And too many people are willing to leave that behind and try to find out what it means for us today. It means for us today what it meant for them then. It hasn't changed. And it says the same thing that yours says the same thing that mine says. We are baptized into one body. And that is the church of Christ. The church for which Christ died. That's the body of which you need to be a member. Period. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. This is a verse that says what I said earlier, that everyone who has been saved has been saved by faith. That is absolutely true. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That is a true statement. Those are the words of Paul. And everybody's Bible says the same thing here. For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. But then, as you get to verse 27, notice what he says. First word there, for. And in the Greek, this is a word of explanation. It's the word gar, G-A-R. He's telling them what that means. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's not hard to understand. And if a person's not been buried in water for the remission of sins, they've not been added to the body of Christ. They have not put on Christ. Some, some of your English, I don't know, some of you may have this, but some of your English versions say something along the lines here of um, you've been clothed with Christ. That's what happens in baptism. Again, this goes back to Matthew 28. You become a possession of His in the act of baptism. You've submitted your will to His by faith. You're saved by faith. And that faith is explained there what that means in verse 27. You've been baptized and have put on Christ in baptism. Turn over to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12. This goes right hand in hand with what we read earlier in Romans chapter 6. And this, frankly, this contradicts what a lot of people says. Because one of the most common charges against churches of Christ is that we teach a works-based salvation. Baptism is a work. You can't be saved by works. Therefore, you're teaching a works-based salvation and you can't be saved. That's kind of the logical... Illogical, but that's the logical approach that some people take in terms of churches of Christ. Let's start in Colossians 2 and verse 10. And ye are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Of course, that's Jesus. In whom also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands 
in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The question is, how did that happen? How did you, to circumcise, to cut off, how did you cut off the body of sins? Just read verse 12. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith in the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Your sins are cut off when you are baptized into Christ. Not before that. They're not cut off when you believe that God exists. Your sins are not cut off when you accept Jesus into your heart, which no one was ever told to do. Your sins are not cut off when you say the sinner's prayer, which no one was ever told to do anyway. But most denominational groups believe that and teach it. Your sins are cut off when you're buried with him in baptism. But here's something else important in this verse. Is, is baptism a work of man? Well, let's answer that in this way. Well, it's something you need to do. It's something you have to do, in fact. If you want to have your sins washed away, you have to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. So yes, it is something that you do. But look at what he says here. Through faith in the operation of God. And if I'm not mistaken, the New King James says, through faith in the working of God. So you read that verse and tell me who works in baptism. Is it you or is it God? Well, it's God. It's God who operates when you submit your will to his and you go down into, as we say, into the watery grave of baptism. You're buried. He removes your sins. And as this verse also says, you are also risen with him. Just like Paul said in Romans chapter six, isn't it interesting that Paul's so consistent in all of his writings? He says the same thing to different groups of people. Let's look at this last one and then we'll just close it out. First Peter chapter three and verse 21. This is in the context of great persecution. You, you go to. Did I say first Peter one? First Peter three. When you go to when you read first Peter chapter one, you, you read about the fiery trial. These people were enduring great uh, persecution for their faith. And he's giving them reassurance of their salvation. And he pulls from the Old Testament. He talks about Noah. Look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, talking about the people of Noah's day, which sometimes were disobedient. You know, there were only eight people saved in the flood, right? According to the biblical text. Sometimes were disobedient when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Listen to this. Wherein? The wherein is a reference to the ark. Wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved. Look at this. What were they saved by? They were in the ark, but what saved them? Water. Well, how does that happen? Because water destroyed everything else. Well, the water lifted them up above it because they were in the ark. That's the point. I actually heard, I was listening to a debate the other day that a friend of mine was in. And the person he was debating was denying the necessity of baptism. And he looked at 1 Peter 3 and 20 and he said, no, those people were saved by the ark. That's not what that verse says, is it? Look at the end of verse 20 again. The ark was preparing wherein eight souls were saved by water. The water destroyed those who were disobedient, but it saved those who did what God said. And only eight people were saved. So what's Peter's point? The like figure, whereunto even baptism, water, he's talking about water. That's the only thing that can be referred to here. Doth also now save us. A lot of folks, look at that verse in verse, look at that word in verse 21. That little word now. Do you realize how many people have taken that W and replaced it with a T? So many people want it to say this. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also not save you. But what my Bible says is the same thing that their Bible says. Baptism does now save you. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. In other words, you're not taking a bath for, for a physical cleansing. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That, those are the ins and outs of baptism. Baptism. Those are the, as we, again, as we call it, the nuts and bolts. And anybody that has a Bible that can read and can ask questions on this subject will get the same answers that you and I get. Men and brethren, what shall we do?
Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Well, how do I do that? Well, you need to be buried with him by baptism into death and then be raised to walk in newness of life. Well, what happens when I do that? Your sins are washed away, Acts twenty two sixteen. You become a child of God by faith, Galatians three twenty six, because you have put Christ on in baptism, Galatians three twenty seven. And baptism does now save you. Now, here's what we need to understand. All right, because I don't know how many of you have heard this, uh, have heard of what's called baptismal regeneration. You may be familiar with that phrase. You may not be. Basically, what that means is people look at the churches of Christ and they say, you teach baptismal regeneration, which basically means the water saves you. I don't teach that. The water doesn't save you. God saves you because you do what God says. Jesus is the Savior. There's no question about that. So what often happens is people misrepresent what you believe. And they say things that, that I've never said and they'll say things that you've never said. Don't let people do that. If they ask questions, will you believe that the water saves you? No, I don't. Now, do you have to go into the water to be saved? Yes. But who saves you? Well, that's Colossians 2 and verse 12. You're baptized and you have faith in the operation of God. It's God who works in baptism. It's not me. I'm doing what God says, but God will do what he's promised. And that goes back all the way to the Great Commission. The promise. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that's, what, that's all we want. And this is simple. This is not difficult to understand. You don't have to go to seminary to understand this. And my Bible says what your Bible says. There's no difference. So why won't people just obey it? Well, most of the time, most of the time, it's because their religious background won't let them believe it. They are, you know, whatever religious um, group they may come from, their church doesn't teach that. And so that's a struggle for a lot of people. But we have to go by what the Bible says and not by what some group says or some man says. The Bible is very clear. So there may be someone here today who has more questions about this particular subject. Don't leave here without asking those questions. We'll be more than happy to sit down with you and study our way through the Bible on this subject. But maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you know what you need to do and you're ready. Well, we want to encourage you to obey the gospel this morning. And we'll do whatever we can to help you. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. Be added to the one body. Have your sins washed away. Be clothed with Christ. You become a possession of the Godhead. All of these things that we've talked about by simply submitting your will to God's. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not done that, or you've done that, but you've not remained faithful to what you have done. We want you to be restored. You can always come back and you do that by what we read in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. You, re you repent of those things. You confess and you pray to God for forgiveness. And we know that he'll forgive. If anybody needs to respond to the gospel this morning, let's do it right now as we stand and sing.